In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus is commissioning the disciples to go out and evangelize the house of Israel, he says. He tells them to preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He also says to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, all those things. Now, the next part is interesting, and it, it might bother those of you who tend to overpack before a trip. He says, do not acquire gold or silver or copper for your money belts. Like, don't take any money. Or a bag for your journey, or even two coats, or sandals, or a staff. In other words, don't take anything except for what you're wearing right now. Luke recorded these instructions a little differently. He said, take nothing for your journey, neither a staff, nor a bag, nor bread, he says, nor money. And do not even have two tunics apiece. Now, later on, back in Matthew's account of that story, he quotes Jesus in saying, Behold, I send you out, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. In other words, it's going to be dangerous out there for them. So Jesus tells them to be as smart or as wise as a snake, and yet also to be as innocent or pure as a dove. He even describes them as sheep surrounded by wolves, practically telling them they would be attacked. There's a lot of animal metaphors there, but Jesus is telling them they need to be careful. That's, that's the elusive, defensive snake part of the description, while also refraining from retaliation or being combative like that of a dove. So, if you're keeping track of everything so far, these disciples were to take nothing with them, and though they're supposed to try to avoid physical threats whenever they face attacks, they should not attack back. I mean, if you were in their sandals, would you still go? What was the point of all these prohibitions? Why couldn't they pack like normal for their journey? Why couldn't they defend themselves or better yet, take some kind of, some form of defense like a, you know, a club or a sword of sorts? I don't know about you. I, I think I could make it on this trip without the extra clothes, but going without the money and, and also being instructed to not utilize self-defense, um, that's what I would have a hard time with. I want to know what you think in the comments. But again, why weren't they allowed to utilize these normal things? Much later on in Luke's gospel, it's the night before Jesus' death. It's his last night with them. There are there's several moments recorded from this night, but Jesus has just told them that he's going to be leaving them. It's time for him to go. And after, after they celebrate the Last Supper, the Passover meal, Jesus shares this with them, and the disciples are upset about this, especially Peter. So then Jesus starts to tell them some things to prepare them for what's coming next, like in his absence, while he's gone. John's gospel includes Jesus telling them about the coming of the Holy Spirit. But Luke records this interaction. Jesus says to them, "'When I sent you without money belt, and bag, and sandals, you did not lack anything, did you? And they said, no, nothing. Okay, so Jesus is showing them, and, and he's showing us here, that that reason for those uh, prohibitions was for them to learn dependence on his providence. They didn't lack anything. He didn't want them to take anything on their trip, including money and clothing, and he didn't want them being physically combative or defensive because, because he would provide them everything they would need. They didn't lack anything. But here, on the eve of his death and his crucifixion, as he's preparing them for his departure, he says this next. But now, but now, whoever has a money belt is to take it along. Likewise, also a bag. And get this. Whoever has no sword is to sell his coat and buy one. 
they respond, look, Lord, there's two swords here. And he says to them, it is enough. Or that's enough of this. In fact, in that day and area, uh, thefts and robberies were pretty common. And, and so, so was it a common practice that many people carried these short blades, almost like knives. Now, whereas before Jesus was sovereignly meeting their needs in money and clothing and protection, here he's saying they must provide for their own support and protection. He even says that if they don't have a sword, which was, again, like a short dagger-like weapon, almost like a knife, that they should sell or trade some of their clothing to buy some. It was that important. Now, that was the mentality 2,000 years ago, even of Jesus. But there were many ways that people could die, whether that be by, you know, natural causes, some sort of disease, old age, or, you know, some by sort of capital punishment. That's what Jesus died from. But of these causes of death and mortality, none of them were any sort of gun or firearm, because, of course, guns wouldn't really be invented for another 1,300 years or so in the 13th century, unless, of course, you count what the Chinese created in the 10th century. Yes, guns are that old, but they're not old enough to be found within the eternal pages of Scripture. But here we are in the 21st century. Guns are clearly a much debated topic these days, although the media and most liberals are very picky and choosy about which cases and incidents they utilize to promote either the stronger regulation of firearms or just the outright abolition of the Second Amendment. At least once a month now, we're seeing or hearing headline news stories about a tragic shooting, or as they say, a mass shooting where the gunman has slaughtered numerous individuals, which usually includes the shooter taking their own life in the end. Now, speaking of causes of death in the first century, what would you say are the top 10 causes of death in the United States? And, and where in that do you think homicides would rank, like in relation to gun deaths? Now, I already know what's happening in most of your heads. For the conservatives watching, I think I know what you're guessing, and for the liberals, I think I know exactly what you're thinking. But let's just start with number 10. Tenth place is chronic liver disease. Okay. Then in ninth place, we have kidney disease. Those are both around 50 to 60,000 deaths each last year in 2022. And in eighth place, eighth place gives us diabetes with over 100,000 deaths last year. Alzheimer's disease is in seventh place with around 115,000 deaths. Again, this is just in 2022. Then respiratory disease is sixth with close to 150,000 deaths. So the first half of the leading causes of death so far have been diseases that are difficult to deal with and, and even combat, hardly preventable. Strokes are the fifth leading cause of death in 2022 with nearly 160,000 deaths. Uh, fourth place is COVID-19 with about 180,000 deaths. Again, this is just in 2022, and who knows if they're still padding those numbers, because if you remember, uh, they would mark anyone as a COVID death if they had COVID when they died, not necessarily if they died from COVID, uh, comorbidities. But let's just go along with it. Here's the top three causes of death from last year. In third place, with about 215,000 deaths, are unintentional injuries. So basically accidental deaths, you know, like somebody falling or a car accident, etc. Now, there's a massive jump in the second leading cause of death. With over 600,000 deaths last year, cancer in its various forms took the lives of so many, 600,000. Some of these uh, you can go through treatment to deal with it. Some forms are preventable, you know, like staying away from things that are carcinogenic. But obviously, cancer is a monster which consumes the lives of so many, especially if you think about this 600,000 number only being in the United States just this past year. 
And finally, the leading cause of death in the United States in 2022, claiming the lives of over 700,000 people, is gun violence. No, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's heart disease. Now, heart disease for many is a genetic issue. It's a genetic problem. I, I know a few people like that. But for many that suffer from this problem, it's a problem of their own making. In fact, most of these things on the list are non-preventable, while heart disease or death from such is largely preventable. Here are the four things the CDC recommends for treating heart diseases. First, they say choose healthy food and drinks. Then they say keep a healthy weight. And then they say get regular physical activity. And finally, don't smoke. They also recommend get regular physical activity to help you maintain a healthy weight and lower your blood pressure, cholesterol, and blood sugar levels. Now, with such alarming numbers of deaths related to heart disease, again, it's over 700,000 just last year, where is the public outcry for putting an end to this madness? Where, where's the media running relentless headlines to force the limitations of, of junk food consumption? Where are the politicians campaigning for a crackdown on fast food restaurants? Where are the protests over couch potatoing? Why aren't we forcing people into the gym or tracking their progress or usage of the treadmill? Where are all the lobbyists to block the sale of cigarettes, in fact, outright banning them? Where are the federal regulations limiting work hours and social media usage? What? Do we not see any of this? Well, why not? With such a leading cause of death being so preventable, why can't we take drastic measures to prevent it? After all, we, we would be saving lives. And, and speaking of lives, the CDC surely won't include on their top 10 table the number of abortions because they don't view the baby person as a person. They view the baby as an it that doesn't classify as a death. But if they did, abortion would have been listed as the second leading cause of death um, in 2020 with over 600,000 abortions. Over 600,000 abortions in the United States alone. But that's another conversation for a different day or just later today. I mentioned COVID-19 as being the fourth leading cause of death last year. And as I'm sure you all remember and surely won't forget, the government, most states, and a lot of businesses did everything they could, as forcefully as they could, to prevent COVID deaths. So why not have the same heavy-handedness or iron-fistedness against a killer that claims the lives of almost four times as many people? Well, of course, there is no outrage over this because people prefer to eat what they want and be as lazy and as careless as they want or work as much as they want or be as stressed as they want. It's their freedom to eat themselves to death. So who's going to get in their way? Now, let's consider gun deaths. The CDC reports there were 48,117 lives lost to gun, quote unquote, violence in 2022. If that's correct, then gun deaths would probably sit just below liver disease at maybe 11th or 12th place. But here's the chart from Johns Hopkins. It shouldn't all be classified as violence because most of these gun deaths, in fact, 56% of them are from suicides. 40% of them are homicides. Now, the chart also shows down at the bottom that 649 lives were lost to legal intervention, which is another way of saying law enforcement shootings. That's 1.3%. Again, that's another conversation for a different day. So let's consider these, these top two things. Suicidal deaths by guns can be ruled out of this conversation because a person that wishes to take their life doesn't require a firearm to do it. And if you're saying that it's like self-violence, then it's also self-violence to hit the drive-through too much 
or smoke too many cigarettes or to exert minimal physical effort to get by. So if we remove the gun deaths associated with suicide, that means there are over 19,000 gun deaths last year just in, the, just in the United States. I don't know where we would rank that amongst everything else, but I, I bring up all of these statistics associated with death because we're experiencing nowadays a near drumbeat rhythm for calls for government action against firearms when the leading cause of death killed almost 37 times, 37 times the number, the number of Americans. So why is the media so gung-ho about firearm regulation? Why are liberals so adamant about societal gun removal? Now, I've said this before, but as Christians, we value life, life, more than any other person does. From the womb to the tomb, from tiny to 90, as we say at my church, we want to protect life from the person being a fetus to the person being elderly. When life is lost, we mourn because God mourns over such things. It doesn't matter if it's from heart disease or armed homicide. God grieves over such awfulness, therefore we do as well. When there's a shooting that claims the lives of black people in a grocery store in Florida, we mourn that loss of life. When there's a shooting of six people in a Christian school in Nashville, we mourn that loss of life as well. We mourn the lives lost when it's those three at the Florida Publix, or when it's the over 400 lives lost just in the city of Chicago just this year. But you don't hear about those, do you? So why is it that a genuine Christian should be pro-Second Amendment and opposed to anything that opposes what the framers of the Constitution and the ratifiers of the amendments inscribed 232 years ago. Well, let's consider once again what the Founding Fathers were combating, what they were trying to establish and prevent, and what they believed. First of all, a quick reading of the Declaration of Independence will show you that the United States would be completely opposed to tyranny. Jefferson wrote, When a long train of abuses and usurpations evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies. The history of the present king of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. The Declaration goes on to list every grievance they had with King George, which one of the final grievances was this one. He is, at this time, transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny, already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages, and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. The preamble of the Constitution declares, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, those that would come after us. Do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. In other words, they sought to establish a country based on this, this foremost law, the U.S. Constitution, which would ensure a place completely opposite of the tyranny they just fought against, that they just defeated, and, and that they declared their independence from. 
how would they ensure all these things? Justice, uh, domestic tranquility, common defense, uh, general welfare, and the blessings of liberty. Well, they would go on to list it in the seven articles. Then eventually, in 27 total amendments, the second of which is highly discussed today. It reads, A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. Whoa, now, see, Blake, it's, t it's talking about the armed forces. That's not talking about citizens. It's talking about uh, the army and, and maybe even the police. Well, then why does it say this next? A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So, if you ask the question, why was the Second Amendment created? Why, like, why did they write that? It was added to our Constitution because a well-armed citizenry couldn't be trifled with. The framers sought to establish a land of liberty, one in which the citizens would be a free people, not a slew of subjects under the authoritarian rule of a tyrant king or ruler. And don't give me this argument about muskets and the progression of weapons technology. These were some of the most brilliant men to ever live. You think they didn't have the foresight for such advancements? They absolutely did. But more importantly, they understood the nature of humanity more than we do today. They knew that men are inherently evil. That authority and power corrupts people. That rules in the hands of the wrong person would hurt, not help the population. So they put this brilliant system in place that has ensured our republic to last as long as it has. Jesus, being God in the flesh, obviously knew the natural intentions of man. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows better than the founders that men are naturally prone to evil, not good. This is why on the night before his, his death, before his crucifixion, he told the disciples to arm themselves. You must be able to defend your life if necessary. In fact, self-defense was the primary factor in that case and in the case of the Second Amendment. Some Christians wish to point to a few passages to make a case against firearms, like Proverbs 25, 21 through 22, which says, If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. And if he's thirsty, give him water to drink, for you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. The idea there is that loving your enemy is actually the best way to defeat them. But what if they don't care about your food or drink? What if they're trying to stab you or shoot you or run you over with their car? Obviously, Solomon wasn't in any great danger there when he wrote that. Another passage is in Matthew 5, 38 through 39, in which Jesus says, You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. In verse 38, Jesus is referencing the historic and, and more uh, current form in his day of reciprocal justice. Now, an individual would never carry out such acts of punishment because uh, doing so would be like, revenge, vengeful, and, and God is, is not a fan of people getting even. Just look at Deuteronomy 32, 35. So this speaks to retaliation, which is different from self-defense. The former is an attack in return of an attack. The latter is the prevention of an attack. Another argument is made from Romans 12, 17 through 21, which in fact, I'm going to use inside out to favor sound self-defense. Paul says, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. 
Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But, and here he's quoting, If your enemy is hungry, feed him, and if he's thirsty, give him a drink, for in doing so you will heap burning coals on his head. He's quoting Solomon. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, on this same note, some like to use Peter's actions in the garden on that same night in the Garden of Gethsemane to make their case. Jesus had just given them these instructions about buying a sword, and they've made their way to the garden. Jesus is praying. Then the mob shows up to arrest Jesus, and Peter cuts off the ear of one of the arresting guards. Matthew's Gospel says, Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you think that I can't appeal to my Father, and He will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? How then will the Scriptures be fulfilled, which say that it must happen this way? So Peter's worst offense there was attempting to prevent the will of God from being carried out. Jesus had to be arrested. Peter stupidly cut off the ear of what would be, like in modern times, a police officer. So there was no respect for authority there. But finally, this wasn't self-defense. It wasn't even a good defense of Jesus' life either. Peter lashed out and attacked a a horde of arresting officers when they were outnumbered and surely outarmed. And worse, Jesus was just talking to them. Like nobody was trying to murder Jesus on the spot. So Peter messed up and Jesus made that clear. So obviously there, there is clear from scripture that there must be sound judgment and wisdom when it comes to utilizing self-defense. After all, Jesus told them to be wise as serpents, yet innocent as doves. If there's one thing Christians understand, it's that people are naturally evil in this fallen world. A gun is merely the tool in the hands of an evil person whenever it's used for evil deeds. But so is a regulation in the hands of a tyrant. The founders understood this very thing. That's why the Second Amendment is the only amendment to the Constitution which practically has bolded the words, shall not be infringed. Therefore, until we're face to face with Jesus, we're responsible to ourselves to make sure we're fed and supplied. And if we're without protective arms, you better sell your cloak to have one. The majority of you are coffee drinkers, and maybe some of you fancy yourselves coffee connoisseurs. Well, whether you're someone who likes to down a quick cup to get a caffeine dose, or you just enjoy the art of crafting an excellent cup of joe, you've got to give my friends at Blackout Coffee a shot. They've got bags of ground or whole bean coffee or single serve pods. They've got many different blends, flavors, and roasts. My personal favorite is called Morning Reaper. It's one of their medium roasts. Use my code BLAKE23 for 20% off. That's B-L-A-K-E. Two, three for a discount and level up your morning cup with blackout coffee.